continue our coverage of the Ed Burke trial, the verdict coming in this afternoon, just within the last hour or so. We do want to check in with David Greising. Are you, are you there with us? Yes, I am. All right, let's get your initial reaction to this, David, with the BGA. <sighs> Well, uh, we believe in justice, and it looks like justice has come uh, after a too long wait uh, to Ed Burke. Uh, this was uh, one of the most important trials in the history of this city, even though we've already seen 38 other older people go to jail over the years on various causes of corruption. This was one of the most uh, far-reaching and, uh, and, and exasperating cases uh, that we've ever seen. And as part of this broader federal investigation into corruption in Illinois, uh, it for a second time this year makes the case that uh, illegal conduct, uh, use of office for personal benefit is not acceptable in Chicago. Maybe Chicago is ready for reform after all. David, do you, are, you know, I've always been struck by, I've had conversations with friends in the business, those who are in politics and government, and we would always say that, no, not Ed Burke. He's just too smart. Mm. It won't happen to Ed Burke. Do you feel that way as well? Well, uh, they used to say the same thing about Mike Madigan, and he stands indicted right now of federal crimes. Madigan famously rarely used his cell phone, et cetera. Mm. Uh, sometimes people are too smart for their own good. And in this particular instance, it looked as if Ed Burke perhaps thought he was so smart. There's no doubt he has high self-regard, or did at least before he was convicted of these federal crimes. Uh, but it, when you listen to the tapes, uh, the land, the tuna tape, of course, sticks in everybody's mind. This is a person who was very comfortable doing what he did. And as it turns out, what he was doing, as he certainly must have known at the time, was illegal. Can I tell a quick story about just how punitive in nature Ed Burke was? It was more than a decade ago. Chicago was bidding for the 2016 Olympics, and there was a private Olympic bid committee that was run by uh, Pat Ryan, who was a tycoon of industry uh, in Chicago. And Ed Burke wanted a couple of his guys on the committee. And, you know, oh, here, here's a resume. I'd like you to pass it along. He gave it to, I don't know who, but some people on the committee. Uh, the committee didn't end up hiring those people. And you know what happened next? Miraculously, there was a city council co committee hearing where the Olympic bid got called before the council, and Ed Burke, like a pro, stood up there questioning every expense, every motive, and he looked like he was on the most noble of missions you could ever <laughs> imagine. And David Grison, you, I mean, you, you worked at the Trib for, for years and years and years. There are countless stories just like that. Well, uh, yes, Ben, and, and, and uh, something very similar came up with in this case with the Field Museum case where he wanted to get his goddaughter an internship and threatened to hold up an admissions increase that the field was in desperate financial shape at the time. Uh, he, he did both the public uh, posturing that you've described as well as a very hard hardball behind the scenes stuff. Uh, that That's no doubt. The, what has struck me since this case first became public years ago, is how many people talk about what a raconteur he was and how much they enjoyed playing, listening to him play the oh. piano at his holiday celebrations. And uh, he would, of course, uh, stand up and, and um, bestow his wisdom and knowledge about the history of Illinois and the history of Chicago. And so those days of Ed Burke as as a the dean of the city council, the longest serving uh, uh alter person in Chicago history, that all is gone now. His record will be one of being a corrupt and convicted criminal. And why people such as him don't take that into account when they are going to the dark side, uh, I'll never fully understand. In this instance, at least he was trying to make a lot of money. Sometimes we see these people go down for really petty corruption. This was wholesale corruption aimed at enriching himself by millions of dollars, no doubt, in legal fees on the thriving real estate appeals practice that her, his firm ran in competition, I might add, with Michael Madigan's real estate uh, appeals practice mm -hmm. as well.
That's a case that's coming up soon. I do want to ask you, where do you think we go from here? And, and we talked about earlier about reform and making sure that something like this doesn't happen again, that it's not common practice from now on. So I'm wondering, uh, what's your take on what's being done on a local level, on a state level, to address situations like this? Well, at as I was coming on the air, you all were talking about, mm -hmm. you, you were quoting from some of Mayor Lori Lightfoot's comments, and obviously she had a personal issue sure with did. that, Burke, which she made very clear right from her first council meeting. And of course, going back to the racist tropes that were used during the, the council wars, the Verdoliac 29 wearing white buttons on their lapels, et cetera. That's the sorry history that we have to remember at Burke by as well. But going forward, uh, the one that stands out to me, the target that we as as a good government organization are really focused on is that while aldermanic privilege has been reduced, privilege with regard to zoning, an alder person still has unquestioned thumbs up or thumbs down say over zoning uh, decisions that are made in their wards. And we saw that zoning requests, uh, uh, Danny Solis, one of the key witnesses here, uh, he was in charge of the zoning committee. Uh, Ed Burke, a lot of these were permits and such, but it all circles around that question of the power that all the people have uh, over these decisions that ought to be bureaucratic city decisions. They don't need to be aldermanic decisions. And certainly the old thumbs up, thumbs down for everything that happens in your ward, that has to go. It is an invitation to corruption. And as we've seen through history, alder people in Chicago are often, are sadly, are not willing to resist. It's a monumental task, though, to mm -hmm. say the least. I mean, some people have been pushing to reduce the council's size from 25, uh, from 50 to 25, and even smaller by some measures. But in terms of the favors and, and things getting done through the different wards and all the manic districts, that's just how it has been forever, right, David? It, it allows that, that older person to ingratiate him or herself to their voters. So I just, I don't see that ever going away entirely. Are you saying Chicago ain't ready for reform? Pat? That's what I'm saying, <laughs> Mr. Bradley. Well, the, the whole idea of the mini mayor who has dominion over their one of 50 wards is really problematic. It is, as you said, it, it's built into our system and it's something that other cities have gotten away from uh, or never had to begin with. And and it, it but, but. It, it would be difficult to uh, undo that, there's no doubt. Uh, reduction of the wards. We have all these li little fiefdoms all across our city and broken down according to the racial and other characteristics. So it would be very difficult to undo, but we can undo the unfettered powers that we give to these alter people. And we could potentially undo if we went to an at-large election system or something, we could undo those. But in the immediate term, if we professionalize some of these decisions that currently are politicized, sending them to uh, a, a bureaucracy, the city government that has to answer to uh, the voters directly rather than through their alter person. If we give alter people less direct control over what happens in their wards while still allowing them to be responsive to the needs of their constituents, uh, those are some changes that can be made and I think realistically uh, should be made. In the meantime, you would think that cases like this uh, are enough to scare many of them uh, and push them into doing the right thing, right? We would hope so. Uh, but again, the, the decades of corruption that we see, it just seems that there's a refresh. A new group comes in who maybe is not that uh, familiar with the consequences. At least now we are seeing over the last number of years of federal government that has figured out a way to take on these cases and to get results at trial. And uh, it is perhaps a wake up call or as for uh, for people who are currently in office as well as those who may run in the future. I, th I think they've been saying that since uh, former <laughs> Governor Dan Walker was uh, convicted mm. back in the 70s. Uh, no doubt. Uh, I mean, we've got this sad history both at the state and the Chicago level. And um, that's one of the reasons the Better Government Association has been in business for 100 years. Mm -hmm. And sadly, uh, we still have a lot of work to do because uh, it, sometimes they just don't learn these lessons. Yeah. All right, David Greising, we appreciate your time with the BGA, the Better Government Association. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank All you, right. sir.